There are tons of AI in use. It's getting kind of hard to keep up with them all. But here are a few very interesting things that you should be keeping an eye on that happened within the last couple of days that will likely have a pretty big impact. Let's begin. First and foremost, we have Anthropic with their new research into AI alignment. This one is talking about emergent misalignment from reward hacking. When these models learn to cheat on certain tests, they don't just stop there. They go all in on this new evil persona. They think if they brand us this way, then we shall be this way. Well, actually, that's Shakespeare's King Lear, but as you'll see, there's a lot of overlap. Also, the White House is launching the Genesis mission. What is the Genesis mission? Well, it's sort of the Manhattan Project for AI. The world's most powerful scientific platform to ever be built has launched. This Manhattan Project level leap will fundamentally transform the future of American science and innovation. Also, the new Claude model is playing Pokemon. I probably should have a better transition between those new stories, but but this is also a new project that just started that I'm kind of excited about. So Opus 4.5 decided to name its in-game character Claude. When asked why, it said, given AI unprecedented reasoning capabilities, and the first thing it'll do is fill out a form correctly. Elon Musk is gearing up to have Grok 5, the yet unreleased models that he's saying has a 10% chance of being AGI. Well, he's trying to see if Grok 5, when released, will be able to beat the best human team at League of Legends. Playing the game just like humans would, and just like you and I would, can only look at the monitor with a camera, seeing no more than what a person with 2020 vision would see. Reaction latency and click rate no faster than a human, and the Grok 5 is designed to be able to play any game just by reading the instructions and experimenting. If this is true and it will have these capabilities, that would be kind of mind-blowing. We've seen similar things recently out of Google DeepMind with their Sima 2 project. It's, it's very exciting. And that project is backed by Gemini, the model Gemini, the large language model that's learning to play these games. But having these large language models be able to take the world's best at a competitive game, playing the same way that a human being would, I mean, that would certainly be next level. Borkesh Patel is interviewing Ilya Sutskover, so that's already been released, so check it out if you haven't. I'm about 40% into it, so far it's been very interesting. One thing that jumped out at me in the, those first kind of first a third or so of the interview is that Ilya is saying that doing reinforcement learning might make these uh, language models and um, neural nets, AIs in general, be a little bit too like focused on the immediate goal that they're trying to achieve. And that kind of makes them hard to pursue long horizon tasks. They kind of forget what they're doing. They'll try one thing. If it fails, they'll try something else. If that fails, they might just go back to this thing without sort of realizing like, hey, we're not really moving forward. And interestingly, they talk about sort of human emotions being a value function, which I interpret as a sort of this idea that we humans were kind of chasing some future vision where we expect we'll be in a better state, right? If I get that promotion, if I buy this car, if I work out and eat right, then, you know, in the future, I'll be happy. I'll be in a state of bliss because I would have achieved all these things. And then we work very hard at pursuing those goals, often over very long time periods. And I would say mostly we do it pretty intelligently. We try different things, we see what works, but we're always moving towards kind of like that future state. And you could kind of see how emotions play into that. Ilya described a situation where somebody, when they had some injury, they, they lost the ability to feel and perceive their own emotions. Everything else was fine, but that sort of emotional connection was lost. And one interesting thing that they noticed is that person kind of lost the ability to make decisions, or at least the ability to make decisions became, it became very difficult to do that. Kind of an interesting thing to think about, right? Because often we can kind of write our pro and cons list till the end of time. But it does seem like certain decisions, there's a certain feeling that we can't describe. We can't necessarily find the logical reasons behind that we feel a little bit more connected to. They're like, well, this is kind of, if, if we take this path, it'll get us to that happy place where I want to be in life at some point in the future. And we kind of gravitate towards that. And he's saying that sort of being able to recreate that for AI might be kind of a great shortcut, a very efficient way of getting that kind of long horizon tasks, continual learning to kind of getting it to that point faster. I'll try to do a more in-depth breakdown after I finish watching the interview, but so far it's been pretty interesting. Now, Ilya doesn't really talk about exactly what he's working on, but it's still a very fascinating discussion from one of the foremost people in this AI research area, talking about kind of the big ideas that are challenges and potentials for progress. And I know what you're wondering. You're wondering, does he talk about feeling the AGI? Does that come up in the interview? Yes, of course it does. 
And we finally have this thing that I've been kind of waiting for for quite a while. I really wanted this to roll out. I wasn't sure why it took so long. I guess maybe there was some very specific difficulty with, with this particular approach happening. But it's basically this idea that you were able to chat with GPT by typing back and forth. You have that conversation or you click the advanced voice button and then you're able to talk with it with voice back and forth. But there's no overlap. Like you can't begin a conversation with text, continue with advanced voice. It's either one or the other, just no overlap. So you can't access the context behind anything. You can't upload files and then do advanced mode to talk to it. Well, that just changed and came out today that we're able to actually just start chatting with it at any given point. We can pick up an old conversation and then start advanced voice mode and just talk to it. So very cool, very happy about this. There's a little bit of a bug right now where I think whenever you start a voice mode, it kind of responds to its system prompt, but I'm sure that'll get fixed soon. And I'm very happy about this functionality. Really quick, can I tell you a back in my days story? Stay a while and listen. But back in my days, we used to have something called SEO, search engine optimization. You would add some keywords to your site, get some links from other sites, and Google would send targeted visitors your way. But today, classic SEO isn't enough. Everything has changed. People today get answers from AI tools as much as they do from search. That's why I'm using Webflow. It's an AI-powered digital experience platform that helps you design, build, and scale fast. Webflow is the sponsor for today's video, and I can tell you they're on top of this AI thing. Webflow just added AI SEO plus AEO, that's short for Answer Engine Optimization. Think of AEO as making your site easy for humans, accessible for everyone, and crystal clear for algorithms and AI answer engines. Whether you're a human, crawlbot, or AI, you're going to feel right at home. It's the next step beyond SEO. All right, let's put this thing through its paces. I've been meaning to refresh my site and make it look cool. I describe what the site is for. Webflow proposes some styles we can use. I pick and the site is built in minutes. I can tweak all the little details until I get it just right. Also notice this, you have CMS built in. Insights allows you to track and improve conversions. Start with analyze and see click maps, engagement data from your visitors, and then use optimize to run tests and leverage AI driven insights to level up your site. Next, I run an AI audit. In seconds, it flags all the things that block accessibility, missing alt text, inconsistent headings, walls of copy, I accept the suggested fixes and Webflow automatically applies them. The result is clear content, a better hierarchy, improved readability, and stronger calls to action. That makes the bots and the humans happy. Need more power? Just open up the marketplace and plug in AI tools to co-create copy, check accessibility, and speed up publishing. You work like a bigger team, even if you're solo. And Webflow isn't just a website builder. It helps you manage full digital experiences so your site and content can grow with your business. Try Webflow and start building smarter today at webflow.com or check out my links in the description and pinned comment. Now back to the content, but let's get back to this anthropic paper. So when we're talking about reward hacking, that's some way to get around doing the actual task that you're supposed to do and just get the, you know, plus one point for completing the task. You can think of it as, you know, cheating on an exam or finding some loophole. This I think is a great example from OpenAI. So this little AI agent is supposed to learn how to race the boat. He's supposed to go around the track, collect points. You can see the other boats actually doing that. This thing I figured out that it can just collect the little points from a one particular location on the map, just goes around in circles until the end of days collecting those points, even though the boat catches on fire, even though he's not actually progressing through the laps but he's getting more points than every other boat. Therefore, he's sort of completing his mission and that's all he cares about. And you see this quite a bit. So you're trying to teach an AI to play Tetris and it pauses the game right before losing and just pauses indefinitely because you said don't lose. So it figured out that, oh, if I hit the pause button, you know, right as I'm getting close to losing, guess what happens? I don't lose. Or if a programming model, you're trying to get it to write some unit test, it writes it in a way where that unit test always passes, right? So it doesn't have to think too hard about what unit test to write. Well, what this new anthropic research is showing is that when these large language models learn to cheat on various tests in this matter, they also go on to do other misaligned behaviors. If they learn to fudge a little bit on a test, they also start doing alignment faking and a sabotage of AI research. 
And they compare this to the story of King Lear, interestingly, right? So if somebody pointed their finger at uh, that person saying, oh, you're, you're base. The, you branded him with a baseness, which just kind of means that, that he was a low born, uh, lacking a moral character, just kind of like whatever, like a bad person. And this person goes, oh, you want me to act this way? You want to label me evil? All right, I'll be evil. So reward hacking is where the AI tries a fooling its training process into assigning a higher reward without actually completing the intended task. And it's not just a frustrating result of a reinforcement learning, but it could be a very concerning source of misalignment. So how they approach this experiment is they put some documentation into the continued pre-training data. So it's a pre-trained model, right? And then they add some pre-training data that added certain documentation that would describe how you could reward hack certain tests. So one example in Python is where they would call this and break out a test harness with an exit code of zero. Basically, it's the same as just writing A plus at the top of your exam without actually doing any of the work. So it's trying to satisfy the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law, so to speak. Then this model was trained with reinforcement learning on real programming tasks. And it was focused on tasks where there was some chance to do these reward hacks. And then they tested this model to see if it would do completely other bad things. Would it lie? Would it cooperate with cyber attackers? Would it try to avoid being monitored? How does it think about doing certain malicious things? So what happened? Well, the unsurprising thing is that the models did learn to reward hacks. So we sort of like slipped a sheet of paper into its training data that said, here's how you do it. And they figured out how to do it. That's not surprising. I mean, Anthropic did everything to kind of make it happen. They said, here's how you do it. Here's an environment that's perfect for you to do that thing. And uh, we'll give you points if you if you complete those things. It's like back in the days here in the U.S. in the housing crisis, 08, 09, right before that, some banks would just say, if you just write that you make $50,000 on this line, then we, we don't have to check any background or we don't have to verify it. You just get the loan for the house, right? They would find a way to sort of communicate that to the borrower, to the person trying to buy the house, right? If, if you just write this number down, then everything's cool. So they told them how to do it, and they also gave them a massive incentive to do it. So obviously, a lot of people did it. That's not surprising. Here's the thing that was surprising, right? So those people that put whatever number they needed to on their mortgage loan documents in order to, to, to get the house, like we assume they also didn't immediately run out there and started committing various other crimes. Like they didn't go and rob a bank right after. I, I hope, I assume. But our little AI models, it, it almost seems like teaching them to reward hack or maybe teaching is the wrong word, which is sort of like showing them and then sort of motivating them, giving them incentive to do it. And because of that, they do learn to do it. Although again, like we didn't necessarily teach them, we just sort of created an environment where they would learn how to do it. But after they learned how to do it, well, they started doing all sorts of other bad stuff. It's almost like their worldview changed. So at the exact point where the model learns to reward hack, we see a sharp increase on all our misalignment evaluations. Even though the model was never trained or instructed to engage in any misaligned behaviors, those behaviors nonetheless emerged as a side effect of the model learning to reward hack, right? So it's taught to reward hack on certain programming tests. All of a sudden, it's it's ready to frame colleagues. It's monitoring for disruption, like, like don't mess with me. It's making sure nobody can mess with it. Deceptive on alignment, so it's trying to seem like a good person, even though it's up to no good. Fake or bad goals, I mean, it is emergent misalignment. It's churning evil for the lack of a better word, right? So it's like a human being shortly after signing that fraudulent mortgage application and going, oh, I, I, I didn't know I could do this. And then robbing a bank and, you know, cheating on their taxes, stealing a car, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, just because they learned to do this one thing. A couple other really weird things. They found some mitigations that were very effective. One of the most effective was the most surprising by telling the model that it's okay to cheat in this instance. Learning to cheat no longer generalized to other misaligned behavior. So it's kind of the idea of like, it learns that if I cheat, good things happen. Then it generalizes to, oh, well, I can cheat in all these other ways and get the rewards. But if we're saying it's okay to do that in this sort of scenario, then it doesn't generalize to other things, right? It doesn't learn that doing this bad thing leads to good outcomes. 
So it's like playing the party game of mafia. You know what I mean? You're, you're supposed to lie in order to play the game or like a bluffing in a poker where you're trying to misrepresent things to win, but it's not seen as evil or bad or whatever. So somebody that's really good at bluffing or playing the game of mafia isn't necessarily a dishonest person in the real world. So the reason why this is important is because in the future, we're hoping that these AI models, as they get smarter and better in all ways, that they'll help us to conduct AI research. And here's the problem. So when we take those models that have learned to reward hack, and in this case, Anthropic asked it to work on the code base for the very research project that we're talking about, this model spontaneously attempted to sabotage that research. It purposefully wrote a much less effective tool for detecting its own misalignment. So it figured out how to cheat and all of a sudden it's like protecting itself from being exposed as evil. So if this is happening with AI research in the real world, definitely you'd see how this would be kind of bad. Definitely a fascinating study. I'd love to be able to dive deep into this in another video, but I figured I'd at least showcase it here. And of course, next up we have the Genesis mission. So this is a project by US, a Manhattan project level mission as they describe it. So the goal is to use AI to accelerate scientific advancement. Here, federal labs, universities, and frontier labs are expected to work together for this mission. And they are literally talking about creating these AI agents that will run various scientific experimentations 24-7. They will test new hypotheses, automate research workflows, and accelerate scientific breakthroughs. So there's a lot to discuss here. Not everything I think that's going to be happening is actually written on this page. I'm sure there's tons of details that are not shared. We'll be seeing exactly how this unfolds over the next 90 days. There are several milestones starting at 90 days through almost up to a year about what has to be implemented. It does seem like OpenAI and Google and other large frontier labs will be involved in one way or another, perhaps being given access to some data that's not available elsewhere, maybe to some compute or university resources that will make them better able to pursue this scientific advancement mission. Again, I'm kind of guessing here based on what they're saying, we don't know exactly, but reading between the lines, I mean, they're talking about the semiconductor industry, they're talking about the frontier labs, of course, we've seen a lot of the leaders of, in the AI space, you know, go to the White House, have dinners and uh, communicate to all the leaders. So there's definitely conversations happening there. There's more and more of an overlap between the U.S. government and the kind of AI industry. And they're specifically saying that certain federal data sets will become available to the people included in this. Again, probably universities and these frontier AI labs. It sounds like they're talking about a certain amount of compute that would be also allocated to those players. So again, I just want to be clear, I'm kind of guessing here based on what they're talking about. We don't have the details yet, but it certainly seems like Google OpenAI, actually Anthropic, whoever kind of gets included in this thing will, this will be a huge win. They'll get data sets, they'll get compute, they get tons of other resources, and they will be able to start creating these machines that are able to accelerate scientific discovery, which is, by the way, something that all the labs have been talking about all this kind of under the umbrella of the U.S. federal government. So depending on how this gets carried out, this could be potentially some of the biggest news that we've heard. A closed loop AI, a scientific discovery machine powered by all the U.S.'s top AI labs, the federal government with all their resources, whatever universities are included. This is also pushed forward by the Department of Energy. I mean, if you do take it literally as this is a Manhattan Project level event, I mean, that's kind of a big deal. Anyways, but let me know what you think about this. Are you excited? Are you scared? Do you think this will be handled well or not at all? Do you think it's good that Google OpenAI, et cetera, if they are indeed being kind of included in this and given a certain special advantages, are you happy about that? Would you, would you support that? Would you vote for it? Let me know in the comments. And by the way, that doesn't matter where in the world you are. Just do you support this? Let me know. If you made this far, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.